Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. Now, why am I dressed like the fifth Doctor from Doctor Who? Because I kind of love Doctor Who. And after a bit of a hiatus, Doctor Who has returned to screens to celebrate its 60th anniversary. And it did so with an episode adapted from a comic strip, a Doctor Who comic strip. And this is only the second time the show has ever done that. The first was when writer Gareth Edwards adapted his 2006 comic strip, The Lodger, into a 2010 episode. That starred the 11th Doctor, Matt Smith. This time, showrunner Russell T. Davies has selected a very cool comic strip from 1980 by writer Pat Mills and artist Dave Gibbons, yeah, the guy from Watchmen, entitled The Star Beast. And I want to talk about that. It's a great comic. We're going to talk about the history of the comic, the plot, how it compares and contrasts with the TV version, and then I'm going to talk about why Russell T. Davies selected this particular comic strip to adapt. Hint, it has less to do with the very cool monsters and more to do with the themes of identity. Without any further ado, please consider hitting like and subscribe, maybe leave a comment below, and let's just get on with the show. In 1979, Marvel Comics branch in England, Marvel UK, acquired the BBC license to make Doctor Who Weekly, a magazine full of new comic strips about the then-current Fourth Doctor. For those who may not be aware, the Doctor is an alien called a Time Lord, and when they're ready to die, they're able to regenerate into a new person, but who retains the memories, experiences, and skills from their past lives. The Doctor, as he is known, travels through time and space in the TARDIS, a machine that's bigger on the inside than on the outside, and is stuck looking like a 1950s English police call box. The Doctor is a champion of the downtrodden and a crusader for justice, though he does not carry any weapons. He almost always has a companion with him, usually someone from modern Earth. At the time of the comic we're discussing, the Star Beast. The current Doctor was the fourth Doctor, played by Tom Baker from 1974 through 1981. He was easily the most popular version until the series was rebooted by Russell T. Davies in 2005. The show had originally run from 1963 through 1989 on the British Broadcasting Channel before returning in 2005. Although, the years in between did have an American TV movie that was in continuity and a number of books, comic books, and audio plays that bridged the TV gap. When Marvel got the rights to make Doctor Who comics, it gathered some top-tier talent. The editor was Des Skin, who had come up through fandom circles and began working in comics professionally in 1970 at IPC Magazines. He was hired by Stan Lee to oversee the Marvel UK division in 1978. Skin also has his fair share of controversy with his Marvel Man run written by Alan Moore, who later alleged that he believes Skin knew that he never really had the rights to that character. But that's a whole separate story. Skin appointed writers John Wagner and Pat Mills to work on the comics. They're both credited on each story arc, but they actually rotated back and forth, and it was Pat Mills specifically who wrote The Star Beast. Pat Mills has been writing comics since 1971, and is recognized as the co-creator of popular British comics like Slanya, ABC Warriors, and for taking over as writer for Judge Dredd in its first year, 1977 when original creator John Wagner temporarily left the title. Mills also had some success in American comics with the superhero satire Martial Law, beginning at Marvel Comics' creator-owned Epic line in 1987. As for what Mills does best, it's probably subverting expectations. He spoke about the Star Beast to the BBC, saying, quote, The whole subtext of the Star Beast, uh, seeing that come together, that's very much the way I, I write anyway, where I flip things over so that what you think is one thing, it's actually something else. 
The artist of the Star Beast is Dave Gibbons, best known as the artist of the seminal work Watchmen, and who broke into comics in the mid-1970s after coming up through underground comics. In IDW's hardcover omnibus, Doctor Who, the Dave Gibbons Collection, we can see Gibbons' sketch submissions for the fourth Doctor, his audition material that got him the job on Doctor Who Weekly, drawing the comics through issue 69, which included switching over to the fifth Doctor. Gibbons shows his mastery of the craft in the Star Beast comic with great likenesses and expressive characters, combined with clear and exciting storytelling from panel to panel. From establishing shots to character design, Gibbons proves that he was going places in this early work in his career. On Valentine's Day 1980, issue 19 of Doctor Who Weekly hit newsstands, and it included the first of an eight-page amazing comic book story, The Star Beast. One interesting thing to note, this is actually the first time the Doctor had a black female companion, and that was 27 years before the TV show introduced us to Martha Jones. This is a really fun story. Let's get into breaking it down. Right off the bat, Dave Gibbons draws a gorgeous splash page, very dramatic, featuring a spaceship crashing over the town of Black Castle in the UK. The design for the spaceship was replicated in exacting detail for the anniversary special episode of the TV show. The spaceship crashes into an old steel mill, which is very similar to the TV show version, except that the TV version later reveals that while it was crashing, the ship actually landed properly in an abandoned steel mill. That's because in the comic, as we can see on the next page, there's a second alien spaceship, but all of the aliens are on the one spaceship in the TV version. The next day, we see school children Sharon and Fudge walking down the streets, excitedly talking about how an alien may have crashed in their neighborhood. And sure enough, they come across this alien creature, which is known as Beep the Meep, because it keeps saying Meep Meep. Meep Meep! Fudge has a smaller cameo type role in the TV version, and Sharon has been swapped out with the character of Rose Noble, the daughter of Donna Noble, a former companion of the Doctor. This is a really fun comic book, but it wouldn't really provide quite enough meat for a full one hour long episode. So there's a second layer to the story in the TV version, and that involves this new version of the Doctor, the 14th Doctor, meeting a former companion, Donna. David Tennant plays both roles of the 10th and the 14th Doctor. We don't know yet why he looks the same as he did in a previous incarnation. That hasn't happened before. And the big deal on the TV show about him interacting with Donna is due to a bunch of timey-wimey adventure stuff, he had to wipe Donna's memory of their adventures together. It was actually a very sad ending for that companion. Um, she couldn't remember him or she would die. So this episode sort of adds Donna back into the mix and introduces her daughter, uh, reintroduces us to Donna's mother and husband who we've met in the show before. Uh, look, behind the scenes, the reason why they got uh, these two characters back is because they're the most popular. Sharon realizes that the Meep is hurt and starts taking care of it and decides that she will hide it because it feels that it's afraid and in danger. Meanwhile, the story cuts above the planet Earth where a second starship is orbiting and that is inhabited by these aliens known as the Roth Warriors. And I have to admit that looking at the spelling, I thought that it was pronounced Wrath or Rarth but on the TV show, they pronounce it Roth, so that's what I'm going with. The TARDIS then materializes aboard the Roth Warriors starship, and the fourth Doctor exits with his robot canine companion, and he's got a big sombrero. He's ready to go on vacation, but he's arrived here by mistake. Looking at the fourth Doctor wearing a festive sombrero, I have to imagine the previous showrunner Stephen Moffat is kicking himself that he didn't think to put the 11th Doctor in a sombrero, because he definitely did put that doctor in both a fez and a cowboy hat. 
The Roth Warriors apparently don't need much light to see. That could be because they've got infrared eyes. The doctor accidentally reaches out and grabs an eyeball, thinking it might be a light switch. This is just an example of the sort of strange humor that made the fourth doctor so popular. He was a little strange, and yet that sort of made him feel just a little bit more alien than some of his previous incarnations. Uh, and it's very in keeping with the stuff that actor Tom Baker would do. For instance, if we look at this clip from The Creature from the Pit, this is Tom Baker improvising how he might be able to communicate with this nonverbal creature. As you can see, he's just sort of grabbing and uh, kissing a tentacle. The Roth Warriors respond to the Doctor by blasting away his sombrero, and it looks like they're about to attack. Let's take a moment to admire the design by Dave Gibbons here. It's somewhat asymmetrical. The Roth Warriors' right arm has some tendrils that can grasp whatever they need, and their left arm features a claw, which we later learn is detachable. They also have a spiked tail, now, if we look at the TV version, it's incredibly faithful to this design. Almost everything there is featured with the one difference of it does not have a tail. But it does add the fact that these Roth Warriors have wings. So that's a kind of nice trade-off, I would say. Here's one other difference. The first five pages ends on a little cliffhanger with a Roth Warrior grabbing the Doctor with a mandible attached to its Hung. That's uh, very in keeping with the movie Alien, with the second mouth inside. This is a cool bit of anatomy. I love the idea and the design. That was not carried over into the TV version. The Roth Warrior is able to render the Doctor unconscious. The scene then cuts to a surgeon. The Roth surgeon implants a bomb into the Doctor's stomach, and that's because they believe that both aliens, the Doctor and the Meep, must be aligned somehow, and they plan to eliminate both of them with one bomb. There's a few scenes of Sharon and Fudge helping the Meep recover, and then we cut back to the Roth starship where the Doctor wakes up and escapes. He flees from the Roth onto his TARDIS. He thinks he's escaped anyway, but as this little comic strip ends, we see that some of the Roth have actually stowed aboard the TARDIS and are ready to blow him apart. Sharon and Fudge let the Meep heal and head out to investigate his starship. However, once there, a bunch of Roth warriors begin to attack them. The Doctor shows up and distracts them by shooting some lasers out of the starship and helping the children escape. This only further convinces the Roth that they are all aligned with the Meep. The children introduce the Doctor to the Meep, and he starts to put everything together. The fact that he has a bit of a stomach ache that can't be explained. The fact that these Roth warriors are hunting for the Meep. He figures it out. He's a smart guy. He figures out that he's a living bomb. That's the cliffhanger for this little comic strip. But, as the next issue begins, the Doctor has ripped some lead off the roofing of a local shed and covered his stomach with it, thereby blocking the signal. At this point, the Meep begins speaking English and they communicate. The Doctor asks why the Meep is being chased by aliens, and the Meep explains, One day, one black day, the Roth Warrior warships landed on my little planet. We offered them the paw of friendship but they offered us only death. And as Sharon, Fudge, the Meep, and the Doctor get on the same page with the Meep's story, we cut outside where some Roth warriors are sneaking up at night onto the local house. We get this great exclamation from the fourth Doctor. Mrs. Higgins, there are aliens at the bottom of your garden. To combat the Roth Warriors, the Doctor quickly whips up what he calls a fizz gig, and basically what it is, is it's a huge light. And he had recognized that the Roth Warriors have infrared vision, so a huge bright light is able to stun them temporarily. But here's a big difference from the comic and the show. In the middle here, we get to hear the Meep's internal thoughts, and we realize that the Meep is actually a villain. The Meep thinks to itself, you stupid Earth creatures, it was easy for a superior intelligence to fool you. 
but it is still distasteful to have this earth child stroking the fur of the Most High, he whose commands have made a thousand planets tremble. And here's a difference between the comic and the TV version, where I think the TV version was simply able to improve on this reveal. Because we, the reader, have now learned that the Meep is evil. He's the bad guy, actually. But the TV version actually has the Meep shoot the Roth warriors in front of the Doctor and his companions. So we actually, in the TV version, are learning that information at the same time as the characters, and our feelings are mirrored in the characters that we're seeing on screen, the surprise, the shock. Whereas, let's go back to the comic and see how that treats it. Again, in the comic, we get to see and hear that the Meep is evil, and then on the next page, the Meep pulls out a gun, shoots one of the Roth warriors dead, and the Doctor is surprised. But he still doesn't quite realize that the Meep is evil because the Meep lies and says, Don't be angry with me, Doctor. I fired because I was frightened. I'm only a little Meep. I would argue that we, the reader, are now well ahead of the main characters. We're ahead of the Doctor in understanding that the Meep is evil, whereas the TV version lines everything up so that we're all on the same page. A little bit better pacing. The comic is actually pretty funny at this point. The Roth Warriors begin to chase the Doctor, Sharon, Meep, and the heroes escape on a local bus. The Doctor ties the Meep up with his extra long scarf to act like it's a pet and he's got it on a lead and everybody just sort of goes with it. You can see the ticket taker just saying, is he house trained? The bus is headed back towards the steel mill where the starship has crashed and the doctor decides that it's time for him to go back and find out a little bit more. His companion Sharon warns, but doctor, the Roth warriors will kill you. The Time Lord cannot be persuaded. Be careful, Doctor. I've never met anyone like you before. You're so crazy. That's the nicest thing anybody said to me this century. I'll meet you both later at the Starship. There's still a Roth warrior back at Fudge's house talking to him and trying to get information about the Meep. The Doctor enters and the tension begins to grow. The Roth warrior threatens the Doctor, saying, You are either very brave or very stupid to return. I just want to get to the bottom of things. Why should we trust you? Maybe I've got something in my pockets that will convince you. Key to the TARDIS, medal for defeating the Cybermen, Galactic Express? That's different, Doctor. Even in the Roth galaxy, we have heard of the terrible Cybermen. In the TV version, the Doctor begins to put together that the Roth warriors are not a huge threat, and he calls for a trial, he humorously puts on a Bannister's wig, and begins the proceedings. Uh, and that's when the Meep betrays the... Uh, Roth warriors and surprises everyone, the Doctor figures out that the Meep is absolutely evil. And from that point forward, the Roth warriors are aligned with the Doctor. Again, for the TV version. In this comic, it's a little simpler. The Doctor just mentions that he's gotten a medal for defeating the Cybermen. We're working in shorthand because these are basically five-page comic strips. You need to move the story forward pretty fast. The Cybermen are a very popular recurring enemy, so it's just shorthand getting the Roth and the Doctor on the same page. I actually think that that's some pretty uh, good storytelling by Pat Mills. The Roth warrior explains exactly what's happening here. He says, very well, Doctor. I am Sergeant Zogroth, and my colleague is Constable Zrig. Those are the exact names of the two main Roth warriors in the TV version, by the way. The events that led us to Earth began on the other side of the universe, on the Meep's homeworld. The Meeps were a highly advanced, peaceful race, who knew nothing of war and cruelty. Hop, skip, jump, and sing. Four jolly Meeps, all in a ring. And throughout the Roth galaxy, their name was a byword for happiness. Then, tragedy struck. Their planet's orbit mysteriously changed. It passed close to the Black Sun. The Sun's radiation mutated the race that was gentle and kind into cruel beasts who lived for conquest. In a savage star krieg, the Meeps overran planet after planet. There was no reasoning with them. The Meeps destroyed everything. Their prisoners were shown no mercy. Hoppity hop, hoppity bop. Who's next for the chop? Reluctantly, the Star Council ordered the use of the Roth Warriors, biological constructs of the five strongest races in the galaxy. We are law enforcers of the stars. We fought the Meeps from planet to planet. 
At last, at the Battle of Yaris, we smashed the Meep's armada. Only their cruel leader escaped. A GLEP, Galactic Law Enforcement Posse, was formed. In hot pursuit, we shot the Meep down over Earth. Here is our official warrant, Doctor, authorizing his capture, dead or alive. And that is nearly exactly what we are told on the TV version. The slight difference is that instead of just being called a Black Sun, Russell T. Davies changed that to calling it the Psychedelic Sun. And also, the Meep has harnessed its power. We see that there's a piece of that Psychedelic Sun within the Meep's starship, which he's able to use to mind control people. Sharon and the Meep have returned to the steel mill. However, they cannot access the starship easily because now it is being blockaded by a military garrison, a military unit called Unit. Unit has an incredibly long history in Doctor Who. They're a United Nations peacekeeping force and scientific uh, explorers. The Doctor frequently works with them to protect Earth from alien threats. Sharon and the Meep sneak into the steel mill, and then the Meep begins killing unit soldiers, activates his starship's black sun drive, very similar to the psychedelic sun that I was just mentioning, and he's able to mind control the members of unit. The comic and the TV show both align here, where the Meep has unit people repairing his ship and getting ready for him to take off, and he marches around in this raised platform, this chair with long legs. They actually duplicated that for the show. The Doctor sneaks up on Sharon to help her, but she is being mind-controlled and attacks the Doctor. However, the Doctor is able to quickly shake her out of her mind control. The Doctor again makes use of his scarf, this time to tip over the Meep's long chair. I love this use of negative space by Dave Gibbons, having the Doctor and Sharon leap into action. The Meep's starship is ready to take off, but he does not plan on using traditional engines. Instead, he's going to use some sort of star drive, which will destroy the entire city. And in fact, that's the cliffhanger we get. The star drive is activated, and we see Black Castle is being sucked into a black hole. That's the drive used to power this ship. However, to everybody's surprise, especially the Roth, they're not dead. One of the Roth says, what happened, Doctor? And the Doctor explains, I reduced the power of the Meep's star drive, giving him just enough power to leave Earth causing a temporary tremor in hyperspace rather than a cataclysm. But enough to destroy these steel mills, we've got to get everyone out. The TARDIS! And of course, like I told you earlier, the TARDIS is bigger on the inside than the outside, so the Doctor is able to evacuate all of the unit soldiers as well as the Roth warriors inside his TARDIS. They go to the Roth starship, which is able to easily catch up with the Meep and arrest him finally. The Meep leaves in chains, crying and trying to pretend it's still cute and innocent, that he's got a twin brother, but of course nobody believes him. And the Doctor shakes the tongue of a Roth warrior and invites Sharon to be his companion. For some reason, the comic books gave the Doctor an original companion, and Sharon became his ongoing companion in the comic books instead of the various TV versions. I'm really not 100% sure why they did that, but it's fun. It just feels like there's extra adventures slotted in between the TV show, if that makes sense. Uh, meanwhile, the TV special, The Star Beast, it definitely follows almost the exact same plot. It just also layers in drama with the 14th Doctor, Donna Noble, her daughter, Rose. Uh, and one fun thing is the immense attention to detail that the TV show has. Russell T. Davies was the showrunner that brought Doctor Who back in 2005. He's a huge fan of this character. He knows a lot about the history of David Tennant's 10th Doctor. That was what he wrote and oversaw. I told you earlier that the Doctor had to wipe Donna's mind from her remembering who he was. There are little details sprinkled throughout that indicate that history, 
that only fans of the show would catch. For instance, uh, Donna's mother does know about the Doctor, and she does not want the Doctor to show up again because she doesn't want her daughter to remember and die. So if you look throughout the house, there's always apples. There's apples everywhere. As in, I'm assuming an apple a day keeps the Doctor away? So why would Russell T. Davies opt to adapt a comic strip from 1980? It's a big deal to have one of these three specials for the Doctor's 60th anniversary. Well, I think it's because beyond being a fun adventure, it's a story that has themes of identity. For instance, we initially think the Meep is cute and innocent, the Roth warriors look scary and foreboding, but we actually learn that it's the opposite. The Meep is the villain, the Roth are law enforcement peacekeepers. That works well because the show is bringing back David Tennant, although he's not playing the 10th Doctor anymore. Now he's playing the 14th Doctor, and he's as confused as the rest of us. Why does he look like a previous version of himself? That's never happened in Doctor Who before. So there are questions that the main character has about his very identity. And to layer on top of that, Donna's daughter, Rose, is trans, and she has chosen her own identity. So there's a lot of thematic stuff going on with what somebody's true identity is, and I think that that's probably why the Star Beast was chosen. So these comics, if you want to read them, they're really fun. You can find them in the original Doctor Who Weekly and Doctor Who Monthly magazines. You can also find them in Marvel Comics. Marvel reprinted those comics uh, beginning in 1980. It was just Doctor Who. It was printed here in the U.S. However, a lot of those reprints initially were using scans, which they didn't have great technology at the time, scans of the British magazine stuff. Not the original boards until like, I don't know, five or six issues in. If you want to see the cleanest version of things, you'd want to pick this up, which is Doctor Who, Dave Gibbons Collection. Uh, it's published by IDW, and it reprints his full run, which includes both the fourth and the fifth Doctor. It is a thick volume, and not a lot of supplementary material. It's just comics, but the resolution and the colors look gorgeous on this. It's oversized. Dave Gibbons is a beautiful, wonderful artist. Everybody that knows him absolutely knows him for Watchmen. Uh, maybe knows him for some of his other great stuff, like the Martha Washington Give Me Liberty run at Dark Horse with Frank Miller. But this is an early example of his work, and it is rock solid. Just really clean storytelling, really consistent, too. Lots of detail when needs to for backgrounds or machinery. It's like there's nothing Dave Gibbons can't draw. So... That's all I've got to say about this really fun Doctor Who comic strip. I'd love to hear in the comments below who is your favorite Doctor. And until I see you next time, keep reading comics. I know, I know. That was a lot to say about a fairly short series of Doctor Who comics, but what can I say? I love Doctor Who. I wanted to talk about something that excited me. I got to do that every once in a while in order to keep the show going. But I also wanted to thank my supporters on both Patreon and on YouTube, uh, the people that have become members there. It really means a lot. I really couldn't do the show without these folks. Uh, they make everything happen. Ad revenue is terrible in general in, in YouTube these days. So it really is the folks on Patreon and YouTube members that make it happen. And I just wanted to say thank you to all of you. It means a lot to me if you're willing to contribute even a dollar a month. That's, that's a big deal to me. It adds up uh, and I'm really grateful for it. Uh, I've got some exciting episodes coming up. I've got stuff where I want to talk about Scott Pilgrim. I want to talk about an Aquaman story that I think went way too far. And uh, I had a really good response to sitting down for a roundtable discussion for Invincible. So I've got some ideas for some more of those. Uh, I'd love to hear if there's some comics you think I'm missing that I haven't covered yet because there's a lot of creators I want to talk about, but I'm also always open to suggestions. 
Thanks, everybody. See you real soon.